Hello everyone, I'm Professor Andrew Hopper from the University of Leicester and I've been asked to help you with one of my favourite topics, how people chose sides and sometimes changed sides during the British Civil Wars. Historians have written a lot about how people chose sides. There were lots of factors influencing this. A person's religious or political opinions might lead them towards one side if they were free to make a choice. There were hundreds of early newspapers making the case for both sides, trying to persuade people. But for many, where you lived and who controlled your local area could often dictate your choice. The war became a battle to control territory, from which both sides stripped out money, food and soldiers to supply their war effort. If the most powerful people in your area fought on one side, it might be difficult to disobey them and take the other side, although in some cases this did happen. There were many volunteers on both sides at the beginning of the wars, but after about a year many of the foot soldiers on both sides were being sent out and forced to serve, often against their will, by their local authorities in their home communities. So how and why did people change sides? Side changing could be a good survival strategy if the enemy conquered your home region. It was easier to go along with enemy demands than fighting on when resistance was hopeless. Some soldiers changed sides after a genuine change of heart, or at least claimed this was the case in order to appear trustworthy to their new masters. Some changed sides in the hope of better food, better clothing or better pay. And then the word turncoat became a nasty way of describing side changes in the newspapers where they were given colourful nicknames such as Judas Chumley at Scarborough, Sir George Chudley, the Grand Ambidexter of Devon, Anthony Ashley Cooper, nicknamed the Dorsetshire Eel for his slipperiness, and lastly Sir Richard Grenville, nicknamed Schellum, the Dutch word for scum, for having changed sides and in the process stolen a coach full of soldiers' pay packets to sweeten his new masters. The amusingly named Sir Faithful Fortescue left Parliament for the King on the war's first big battlefield at Edge Hill, taking over his whole troop of horsemen into the Royalist lines just as the battle started. Sir John Hotham Parliament's Governor of Hull was arrested before he could carry out his plot to surrender Hull to the King. Parliament put him on trial and beheaded him at the Tower of London 18 months later. There was a double standard of course because both sides condemned side changing yet both still encouraged their enemies to come over to their side. But despite being considered dishonourable many more people changed sides than was once thought. Their numbers ran into thousands. I'd like to finish off with the story of Henry Lilburn, the younger brother of the famous leveller leader Freeborn John. Henry was from near Bishop Auckland in County Durham and had fought for Parliament in Ireland. He returned to England in 1647 to become Parliament's Governor of Tynemouth Castle during the summer of 1648, the Scots invaded northern England in support of the king, and Lilburn decided to change sides. He sent those soldiers he was unsure of on errands out of the castle, and then declared for the king, supposedly shooting those that remained who disagreed with him. This infuriated Parliament's governor of Newcastle, Sir Arthur Hazelrig who sent forces to recapture the castle, and in the attack, Lilburn was killed. His wife Anne was pregnant at the time. Twelve years later, in 1660, she petitioned the King, Charles II, to show how her husband's head had been cut off and placed upon the gate at Tynemouth Castle as a savage warning to those considering changing sides in future. So the next time you're out on that lovely sandy beach at Tynemouth, 
Tell your family and friends about poor Anne Lilburn and the thousands of war widows like her who suffered through this terrible conflict.